uh, in the R physician at uh, Holland Hospital. Um, we're about five weeks into the uh, COVID-19 uh, um, closure and um, pandemic. And I first just wanted to ask him, what were your thoughts um, leading up to um, the virus as still, maybe it wasn't even in the United States yet? Yeah, so um, of course, as a, a physician and provider in this, in our local area, um, most of my partners and myself, we were all just kind of talking about what was going on overseas. And I think um, uh, what happened with the first SARS virus that happened back in uh, the early 2000s kind of stayed in Asia, but it became uh, readily apparent that this was spreading out of Asia and into Europe when Italy kind of exploded on the scene in, in February. And I think that grabbed all of our attention. Uh, we were uh, you know, very concerned about what it could do here in the United States. And our hospital started planning, our uh, emergency group started planning together with uh, uh, people inside of the hospital that are uh, you know, part of the administration. And we started preparing and we were all nervous about uh, how severe it could be. Uh, we were nervous about making sure we had plenty of coverage uh, for the pandemic uh, uh, when it came. It wasn't a question of, of if, it was a question of when it would hit our community. And uh, you know, we were a little anxious about that and how, how we would prepare for it. So, so we started early on planning how we would uh, segregate the emergency department to protect people who weren't having respiratory infections but were having more routine kind of emergencies from those who had respiratory problems so that we could try to keep it from spreading inside the hospital to, to people that were there for unrelated problems. And now that it's uh, you know, at Holland Hospital, of course, or you know, in our community, yep. um, like how, what are the measures that you've taken? And then also, um, you know, what have you know, some of your responses to, you know, of course, in our community compared to others? Sure, um, how so, so once, um, things started to go down and the governor elected to shut the schools down. It was kind of hard for us to understand what was going on because we weren't seeing much COVID in our area, if any uh, COVID in our area. We were occasionally testing for it, uh, but not really. The first couple of weeks. Yeah, right? yeah, not really seeing it here. And, uh, and when the governor put the shutdown on the schools, we thought, well, you know, was, is she jumping the gun? We don't really know. Uh, but then once the numbers started coming out of Southeast uh, Michigan and seeing what was going on in, in Oakland County, Macomb County, and uh, obviously Wayne County, uh, those bigger counties that uh, kind of incorporate the Detroit area, metro area, we could see in hindsight that it was uh, probably a really good decision to do what she did when she did uh, because I think we've reaped the benefits of that in, in West Michigan and that we really haven't seen an explosion in growth in the, in the COVID uh, infection because of the quarantine that first started in schools and then spread to businesses and elsewhere. So um, we still have our, our, our department uh, kind of uh, parsed up. We have a section uh, called the dirty section where we're seeing the respiratory complaints. Uh, even our non-respiratory complaint sections of the emergency department are occasionally getting uh, hidden COVID patients that are coming in sounding more like heart patients and so we have to uh, be cautious in those areas and clean those areas and keep those areas clean so that uh, a patient can come in there hours later and not potentially get infected with COVID. So, so we're, our guard is up. Uh, our volume is down considerably. It's up down about half of what normal. Uh, you're saying so you're seeing a lot less patients. A lot fewer patients than we would normally okay. see, uh, because patients aren't coming in even though they're feeling sick, um, and so this is not, uh, you know, good. <laughs> people are coming in sicker. The people that we do see are generally a lot further along in their illness and sicker as a result. So the acuity or the, the toxicity or how sick a patient is, is definitely higher than normal now, but the overall volumes are down dramatically. Um, but I attribute a lot of that to the fact that people have been uh, pretty compliant and staying at home and not getting sick from other illnesses and we're having few car accidents and other kinds of uh, things going on. But long term, we don't know what's gonna happen. Uh, we feel like there's a, a levy out there holding back a, <laughs> tsunami of patients and that levy is going to break sometime. Right. 
And then, um, obviously, I know that you have some colleagues in areas where it's been hit a lot harder, like New Orleans. Um, mm -hmm. What, um, obviously, you've talked with them. What has been their experience and how it's differed from yours? Obviously, they've had more patience. Yeah. But like, what have they... Yeah, they're... Uh seeing a lot more high acuity uh, patients that are having to be put in ICU because of uh, respiratory failure or uh, from the, directly from the COVID infections. Uh, and this is leading to more uh, spilling over to where uh, they're having to put more patients on a ventilator to support their breathing and patients are staying longer in the ICU in these areas uh, for weeks on a ventilator trying to fight off the infection uh, because we don't have a an antiviral medication that's effective against this kind of uh, right. coronavirus. Are they like making longer hours, taking longer hours too? Uh, they're they're st up staffing. Uh, they're having to have more people come in and help out. Um, so yeah, I think some are working longer shifts. Um, I know that patients are staying in the emergency departments on a ventilator because the ICUs are full. They've also set up field hospitals um, so that they can absorb less toxic um, COVID patients. Uh, but my understanding is that those field hospitals are, are not seeing a large volume. Mm -hmm. I know that they initially sent um, the military uh, hospital, uh, naval hospital ships to New York and to LA to see non-COVID patients. And uh, because non-COVID patients are staying away from the hospital, um, uh, they're not really seeing a large volume of patients on those uh, hospital ships either. So, okay. but at this at this time in our area, we're not seeing a lot of it, but we're definitely starting to see some uh, increased positive tests. I don't know if that's because patients are starting to move from areas and starting to transmit COVID into our area. Uh, only time will tell uh, if it takes root. Uh, the biggest concern I have is the older uh, adult communities, especially nursing home facilities. Uh, and trying to keep it from getting in into these nursing home facilities where the patients are so right, And that it can be so easily spread, of course. Because they're easily all spread, the they're all in the same space, and they're right. all extremely vulnerable. Okay. Um, and then last question. Um, so, obviously, you're a doctor, but also you're a dad and, a, you know, brother and everything else. So how has this affected you, maybe you and, like, of course, you know, uh, your family as well? Yeah. So um, everybody is... Um, um, I, I think there's got to be a large percentage of families that are experiencing the, the boredom of being stuck in, in their homes. Um, I think we make the most of trying to do some outdoor activities. Uh, as a family, we've played games outdoors when the weather's nicer, and lately the weather has not been nice. Uh, but when it has been nicer, we've gone outside and uh, played frisbee games with the kids. Um, We've also done a lot of walks in, in bad and good weather, my mom and I have. Yeah. Uh, and I know that Braden's been outside uh, playing soccer. Lots uh, of it. Yeah, training yeah. himself. Uh, and time so on your hands. those, yeah. Yeah, yeah, time on your hands and physical activity, outdoor activity is good. It's just not good to be in large groups. Yeah. So that's, that's the kind of thing that we're kind of trying to focus on is mental well being, is getting, staying active because I think it's good for your heart, mind, and soul to stay active. Uh, Braden's been doing reading, uh, on, reading on a regular basis. We also uh, got them the first gaming system, nice gaming system, so that they could um, yes, sir. have more um, to time to, to have something to do. And also, it's a way for him to communicate with his friends. Hopefully, they don't throw it away after COVID. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. Maybe we will. Maybe we'll take it back and still have the receipt. So, um, those are things that we've adjusted. Um, we've also been doing Zoom meetings. Over the Easter holiday, we actually, uh, uh, Braden's mother is the last of 11 kids. That's right, 11 kids. So oh, large, nice. large family. And we normally get together for Easter, so we got together virtually on a Zoom meeting. And there were, I think, 21 windows, is that correct? Yeah, some, and, yeah. and like 31 people or something. Or more 40, than that. Yeah, yeah, 40, 50 people. Yeah, so it was yeah. quite more. a few people. And that was a different way to celebrate, but it was a way to stay cohesive to stay together and yet yeah, still be apart. Yeah. Uh, and we did with my smaller family too. We did a, um, an Apple call, um, you know, a FaceTime call with our family. So, so we're trying to do that too. Thank you very much, Dr. Griffin. You're very well.